Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. No, finally, we can say welcome back to our church face-to-face -face worship service. It's been a long time, right? Uh, and today, it's the first week of the March. Amen. And wow, it's already third month of the year. And, uh, you know, time flies so fast. Uh, it's uh, March 6th already. And it's been a while since we had our face-to-face, -face, and even that one, uh, the last time, we only had it for a few weeks. And then we had another lockdown during that last time, right? So hopefully this time it's going to be permanent and long term. Amen. And as we return to our physical arrangement today, I'd like to start this by studying a lesson uh, that will somehow help us change or challenge our outlook towards the church and the ministry. Okay? In line with our team, ministry and the church. Okay? This afternoon, I'd like us uh, to look into an epistle of Apostle Paul. And this is a letter he wrote to uh, Titus. So, so our message will be based from Titus chapter 1. And we'll try to cover the whole chapter today. And hopefully on the coming Sunday, I think I'm scheduled next Sunday, so I'm just going to be continuing this. We can cover the remaining chapters from this letter as we continue with this sermon series. Actually, the letter of Titus or the epistle of Titus consists only of three chapters, chapter 1, 2, and 3. But today we'll cover chapter 1. And to start, allow me to share with you some of the observations we can somehow normally see nowadays, particularly in the church and ministry. So we'll look at some of the problems that we can see, some observation inside the church. And what are those? Number one, church deterioration. No? Due to the pandemic, one of the things we can somehow observe is that the number of church goers or active members are decreasing in numbers. You know, there is a decline in number. I don't know if you would agree with me, but according to surveys, there are so many churches that close during the pandemic. People are now getting to used to becoming less and less active and involved in the church. Many have gotten used to staying at home, staying in the comfort of their own house, and neglecting the fellowshipping with co-believers. Now, many have settled uh, for online ministry. Though it's not totally wrong, right? Because we're also doing that. But this is like substituting a meal with taking vitamins and supplement, right? It's different when, when we face, I mean, when we face each other, okay? It's a good thing that we were able to do online ministry, but that is just only to supplement, okay? What else? What else can, can we observe? You know, this one, ministry comparison. What do you mean, Pastor Adel? People are no longer church hopping, but rather they are more into online ministry hopping. You know, oh, let me watch this, let me watch this, right? Comparing every speaker and listening to someone that is less itching to the ears. Worse, listen to this, some they don't listen at all. right? More and more people are getting into the habit of listening online. No, but having a bad habit of comparing it to other ministers or messengers of the word. Oh, he's better than the other guy. So, you know, I, I, I'm saying this is not wrong watching, but if we, we, if we come to that point that we are trying to compare one preacher to another, then there's something wrong, right? And to some extent, some substitute the listening of live preaching from local to those good speakers in the internet. Some people, they don't go to church anymore. They just rather, you know, stay at home and listen. Again, nothing wrong with listening to those good speakers, but still we have to support our local speakers too. You know, our local preachers. What else? Less involvement. You know, uh, what do you mean by less involvement? You know, sometimes it's less for a while. People attend online service even, you know, in their pajamas. Um, again, it's good that we were able to attend, but 
uh, it's deteriorating, right? Less financial support. A lot of church, uh, churches globally have closed due to the lack of financial support from the members. They probably will say, oh, that's not true. But reality speaking, you know, by survey, that is what is happening. Less sanctity of the seventh day rest. Oh, what do you mean, Pastor Del? Less sanctity. Meaning, sometimes people attend, and at the same time, they are working. You know, knowing that they are, they, that they have more, sometimes they know that they have more personal time. Again, I, I, I would like to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative to those people who try their effort to, to listen even to our online studies while they're working, Provided they, they don't have a choice. Meaning, if you are working in the hospital, you don't have a choice because you are needed, then that's fine. But if you have a choice not to work and still you decide to work and to replace, you know, listening to our online service, then that's not good, right? That, that's what, that, that is what I was referring to. Less sanctity, uh, sanctity of the seventh day rest. The Lord asked us to dedicate our seventh day to Him. Of course, I understand there are some doctors, nurses, people who work, right, uh, for healthcare, but not everyone. Not everyone. We know this. I'm, I'm not going to pinpoint, but uh, I hope we realize that. What else? Less church family time. No, when, when we are in our home, individually, some, some people are listening, but Let's be real. Not everyone is listening. Uh, not everyone is sitting together as a family. It becomes individualistic. And, and, and so much more. So much problem, right? And, you know, a lot of churches, some way or the other, have been affected much brought about by the pandemic, right? Like, like what I said, whether you believe it or not, I believe it does. Less order and so much lacking in many ways. And this similar situation is what we are going to study today. The church in Greek had similar problems and they are, uh, that they are facing during those times. And because of that, I'd like to focus our study in that portion of the scripture in order to somehow help us cope up with those similar situations or problems that modern day church is facing nowadays. Again, we look into the letter of Paul to Titus, you know, just like Timothy, the other, the other co-worker of Paul, Titus is one of Paul's student and co-worker in the faith. We'll, we'll find out more information about Titus later during our lesson. We'll try to extract and learn some of the lesson we could get from Paul's letter to him and effectively apply it in our personal ministry and to some extent, to our local church. So again, the title of our message, Straightening, not in Strengthening, okay? That's different. Straightening the Church, lesson from Paul's letter to Titus. This is going to be part one. Like what I've said, it's going to be a series. So today, as mentioned, we'll be covering chapter one. And actually, there's only three chapters in this letter. And hopefully, next Sunday, we can continue in chapter two and three or uh, even on the next succeeding Sunday. As for our purpose, our objective for today, the goal is to understand or uh, how we can strengthen the church to draw out some guidelines, pattern to follow for us to know the roles and responsibility of who we are, everyone inside the church, not only the leaders, but each individual. And as always, we read the chapter and then rightfully divide it to further understand it more carefully. So if you have your Bible ready with you, I'd like to invite you to stand up to give reverence to the reading of God's Word. And like what I've said, open it in Titus chapter 1. And I'll be reading it uh, in the New International Version. So if you have it, just simply follow along with me. Actually, I have it on the board so you could... Read alongside with me. So, this is how it goes. Titus chapter 1, uh, verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at this appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of our God, our Savior. Verse 4, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ uh, Jesus, our Savior. Verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete, there you go, uh, was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that it has been taught so that he can encounter, encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Okay, verse 10. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole household by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of this honest gain. One of Crete's own prophets had said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy glutons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in the faith, and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Verse 15, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and fit for doing any good. And as always, before we proceed, let us come to the Lord and offer our time in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father God, Lord, once again, we would like to thank you, Lord, for bringing us all together here, Lord God, as one body, as one congregation, uh, praising you and thanking you, Lord God. And Lord, as we come to this portion of our service uh, to study your word, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our mind, prepare us, Lord God, to receive your message in our heart. And Lord, personally, I ask that you cover me at the back of your cross. Use me only, Lord God, as your mouthpiece, as your footstool. Be the deliverer of your word, Lord God. Be the speaker. We entrust everything to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, you may be seated. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, the title of our message, Straightening the Church, the lesson from Paul's letter to Titus. And it's going to be part one, right? So that's our message. And as mentioned, we'll try to divide the chapter rightfully to understand it further. So in this chapter, chapter one, I'm only going to focus on chapter one. We'll try to divide it into two major parts, okay? First, we look at Paul's introduction. And based from it, learn some ideas of how and what an apostle like to be. Uh, probably some of you would ask, how is it to be like an apostle? Right? What, are the, what are the things that I have to consider becoming an apostle? Of course, there's no apostle nowadays. Uh, we have preachers, you know, we have disciples, and uh, that title was given to the New Testament uh, characters in the Bible. Secondly, we will try to understand chapter 1, second part, we look into Paul's instruction understand the reason behind regarding his instruction and see some of the details on that instruction. So two things, introduction and instruction. And hopefully by the end, we could recognize some key principles that we could apply, just like what I've said, to our modern day 
ministry, personal ministry. Okay, but before yeah, but before we jump right into it, and I'd like to give you and uh, to give you additional weight to our study. Let me give you first some background about the subject we're going to study. So at least you could have some idea. Okay, first the letter. Uh, uh, we all know that the the letter uh, was written by Paul himself. He's the writer and author of this epistle, the, the the letter of Paul to Titus. The letter is written by Paul probably around 62 to 67 AD. And this is addressed to Titus, who at that time is residing on a separate place called the island of Crete. Okay, so they are not together. So Paul was somewhere and, and Titus is in the island of Crete. So that's the letter. And then the recipient, Titus. Who is Titus? Now what does the Bible says about him? Well, Titus was an early Christian missionary. Thank you, Paul. Pastor, thank you so much. Uh, Titus was an early Christian missionary and a church leader. Okay? A companion of the, and disciple of uh, Apostle Paul himself. You know, he was mentioned several times in the epistle of Paul, especially when Paul write a letter directly to him. He is believed to be a Gentile, converted to Christianity, meaning he was not a Jew, right? And according to tradition, he was consecrated as a bishop, meaning a pastor in the island of Crete. That is where he get his ordination. And common knowledge about Titus. Titus brought a fundraising letter from Paul to Corinth. You will find that in the book of Acts. To collect funds uh, to support for the poor people in Jerusalem. He is the get-go man of uh, Paul during the time. And later on Crete, the island of the place, Titus uh, was appointed, uh, I mean, Titus appointed presbyter, meaning elders, in every city and remainder into his old age. And there he died. Uh, that is the place where he died, in the city of Candia. Okay, so let's look about the subject, the Cretans. Okay, the people and the place. Who are these Cretans? Who are, who are these people? Crete is one of the largest uh, islands in the Mediterranean Sea, measuring 160 miles long, 35 miles by wide, uh, wind, lying south of the Aegean Sea. It has been briefly visited by Paul on his voyage to Rome, and again, you can find that in Acts. Uh, Paul returned there for ministry and later left Titus to continue the work much as the same Paul left uh, Timothy at Ephesus. Timothy was left in Ephesus while, while Titus was left in Crete, okay? And intentionally Paul left them so that they could continue the ministry while he went to Macedonia. So Paul was in Macedonia during that time. So I'm, I was just simply sharing you some of this history just for informative reason. Most likely Paul wrote to Titus in response to a letter uh, from Titus or from a report from Crete. That's why uh, he wrote, uh, Paul wrote this letter. That was the result. So now that we know some background about the author, the recipient, and the place of the people, let us go back and jump into our main topic. Okay? Okay, so here, verse 1 to 4. Uh, this is uh, the introduction. This is our first point. And allow me to read it again. It says there, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Okay? So what can we see uh, or what can we learn from Paul's introduction as to being an apostle? Like what I said, we have only two parts here, right? The first one is the introduction. And what can we learn from the introduction? Let me share you uh, five Five Apostle Principle from Pope Paul's introduction. And thank you so much. And five Apostle Principle. What can we learn from this introduction? Sometimes probably you will say, oh, there, it's just only a regular introduction and there's really nothing much we could find on those introductions. But um, let me provide you five Apostle Principle. Number one. What can we learn from Apostle Paul's introduction? 
Number one, the role of an apostle. Look at that. Look at verse 1. It said, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, in, 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 uh, in the original manuscript, actually, uh, the, the, the word servant was not used. It was bond servant. The original Greek word was doulos, meaning a bond servant. You know what the bond servant is during those times? Because right now, when we think of a servant, we think of a slave. Right? We think of someone who is uh, being forced to, to provide service. But uh, during those times, when you are called a doulos, servant, meaning those are the people who have been uh, dedicated their life. They are the people who dedicate their life to become a lifetime slave to their master because they find that there is no place to go so that they decided to register themselves as a bond servant so that is the idea of uh, what what paul is saying here he was not forced to serve the lord but rather he is more than willing to become servant of god cheerful and not being or not feeling being forced or just being obligated you know, with submission and humbleness. And uh, this is the type of uh, role of what Paul is uh, encouraging us to become like a bond servant, which is willing. Truth is, a lot of people, they, they think that they are servant, but in reality, they felt that they are just being obligated or they are being forced. Right? So, with submission and humbleness, how... Uh, uh, we, we need to become a bond servant, but how can we become a bond servant? Look at this. Actually, this is a, a good verse that I, I, I found. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. How should we serve? Okay? But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So this is what I'm trying to say. You know, when we are serving the Lord, we should be submissive and at the same time humble. Because there are a lot of servants, uh, sad to say, they, they would like, you know, uh, to be the center of the attraction. Uh, you know, everything that they do, they want it to be broadcast. So we need to be a bond servant, meaning when we are a bond servant, we need to be submissive and humble. And that's how we should be, uh, uh, like how we should become humble. Number two, so besides the role of the apostle, what else can we see in this introduction of Paul? Number two, the purpose of an apostle. This should be the purpose of an apostle, you know, to further the faith and the knowledge in truth. Look at that. That is what it says. To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. What should be the result of the purpose? It should be good works, godliness. You know, by the way we act, the way we say things, and the way we think. Right? So this is how we should uh, further the faith of other people. Meaning, uh, how, do we, how do we teach people? How do we teach people? Actually, there are two ways to teach people. Number one, by testimony. By setting an example, you know, things that we show to others. That is one way people learn from us, by seeing our testimony. What else? By directly teaching, you know, by the things we introduce to others. So sometimes we, we teach them by sharing. And sometimes we, we, we teach them by setting an example. And this is how, like what I said, uh, we further their faith and knowledge in the truth. By the way we act, the way we say things, and the way we think. What else? Uh, another principle that we could learn from Paul's introduction. The inspiration of the apostle. So where does the inspiration come from? It says there, in the hope of eternal life. Okay? Uh, God's promise and how how is that to our faith you know we should look forward with great anticipation or expectation this should be our uh, inspiration as 
an apostle, as a servant. Uh, we are we are not serving because it it feels good to serve. We are, though it's good. I mean, though uh, I'm not saying that it's bad. But what I'm saying is that our main inspiration should be coming from God's promise, right? Let's face it, you know some people say, oh, it's nice to serve in that church because they always have food, they always have activities, they always have events. Don't get me wrong, it's good. They have, you know, they have good fellowship. Right? But if that will be your main inspiration while you are attending church, then sooner or later when there is no more happening, then there you go. You leave, you leave the place too. But again, with Apostle Paul, look at where his inspiration is coming from from the hope of eternal life. And, 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 and if we have this kind of inspiration, we will not feel burdened in our ministry. Right? Uh, that everything that we will do, we will be glad in doing that. Because we know that uh, we have that great anticipation to always have that heaven-bound consideration while we live on earth. You know, the idea of as it is in heaven mindset. Meaning every Christian who wants to become a leader or who wants to serve, to become a servant for the Lord, he should always have that mindset, heaven word. Mm -hmm. every, every, every time that you think of something, you know, like we always put into consideration what, 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 what does God would think about what, our, what we are going to do or what are we going to say? So, that as it is in heaven, remember that the prayer, right? As it is in heaven, mindset. Uh, the idea of the word, uh, look at this. I, I, like, I like you to, uh, because when I, when I read this verse, I was so uh, struck by that word, the idea of before the beginning of time. Did you see that? Apostle Paul had this hope of the eternal life, okay, which is good. And who promised that? God. Uh, and it says, who does not lie. Promise. When did that promise have, uh, have uh, I mean, happen? Well, it says there, before the beginning of time. And when is the beginning of time? <laughs> Did you realize that? Wow. Before the beginning of time, God already promised. Before time was invented, God already promised that, that we would have eternal life. Did you realize that? It, it's something to, to thank God about, right? He, he did not promise it when the Lord Jesus Christ was hung on the cross. It was promised even before time was invented. And if there is a before the beginning of time, meaning this is the time where it started, supposed to be. But the Lord is already here. He is not part of time. Do you understand? And then, what is the eternal hope? The eternal hope is the opposite, the end, uh, the, the, the start or the end, or the start of the end of time. Well, when was that? That is eternal life. So there will be no more time during the, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just simply excited to understand, wow, before the beginning of time, there's something that exists already. And then at the end of the, 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 the time, then that will be another starting thing for all of us. I hope you are all excited for that. Yes. Right? Okay, what else? What else can we see on, on, on Paul's introduction? This is just only the introduction and we're learning this principle already. Number four, the task of, of an apostle. What is the task of an, of an apostle? Look at this. To, light, uh, to bring light through the preaching. This should be our goal. This should be our task. Imagine Paul in his introduction is already giving us all this information to bring light by preaching, delivering God's message and instruction and teaching doctrines. You know, in, in our contemporary meaning, it is telling that the Word of God uh, says expressing and exposing uh, what the original author would like to convey. So that is what Apostle Paul is trying to say here. Uh, meaning to deliver God's message, not to deliver one's own opinion. Okay, those are two, two different things. Look at this, and I want you to look at this carefully. Second Peter 1, 20 to 21. Look at this. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy or scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Meaning, 
The, 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 the Bible it doesn't come from anyone. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Because people sometimes say, oh, that, 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 that the Bible was, it was just an idea of man. It was written by Paul or other apostles. But no, look at it. But the men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Meaning, the word that we read in the Bible, it doesn't come from man's own interpretation. It comes from God. Right? And look at this. And this is the task of the apostle to deliver that message. And look at 2 Corinthians 4 2. Look at this. It's uh, without distortion. Look at what Paul is saying. We reject all sin for this and uh, uh, underhanded method. Look at it. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. Okay? The word of God needs to be preserved, it needs to be shared according to what it needs to be shared. We cannot change it. Look at this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19. Look at the warning. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this cross, referring to the scripture. If anyone adds anything to them, look at it. God will add that person to the plagues described in this cross. And if anyone takes word away from this cross or prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life in the holy city which are described in this code. Okay, that is uh, a deeper uh, study, but what it's basically saying is that there is warning against tampering the word of God. And Apostle Paul is saying, this is my role, this is my task, just to deliver the message. And for us, this should be the same thing. We should not try to uh, invent our own opinion when we are sharing the word of God. Share it as what it is. Okay? And lastly, what else can we learn from this introduction? Number five, the gift of an apostle. What is the gift of an apostle? It says there, uh, this is what we should normally bring to men. To bring relationship, look at that, true son in our common faith. So he treat. Uh, Titus as one of his own uh, son, right? To bring relationship and grace and peace from God. To propagate a sense of family, commonality, and togetherness. Unity in Christ uh, and God the Father. So this should be our, uh, our, our gift to other men as well. When we, when we uh, aspire to become leaders or an apostle of the Lord. Okay? So those are the things that I see that I'd like to share with you just in, uh, in the introduction of Paul. Right? The role, the purpose, the inspiration, the task, and the gift. So now that we learn some of the lesson based on his introduction, which is our first part, there are only two parts in this sermon, let's now move on to our second part. The instruction, okay? We're done with the introduction. Now we're going to the instruction. What time did I start? <laughs> it's already. Uh, just cue me if I'm, 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 you know, overboarding with my time. Uh, we can still continue, but let me proceed with the instruction, okay? At this point, uh, let's look at two major tasks that the apostle had instructed. This time, the instruction. What are those instructions? Paul's instruction number one, to appoint elders. That's verse 5 to 9. What else? To silence the false teachers. Verse 10 to 16. Again, just one whole chapter. Uh, let's move on. Task number one, appointing the elders. Uh, what can we see here on the succeeding verse or from the verse that we have read a while ago? I'd like you to read it once you get home as an assignment so you could understand it more. First, let's look at the reason or the purpose of the appointment. Why? Why did Paul task Titus to appoint elders? What is the reason? Look at verse 5. This is what he says. The reason, I left in Greek, was what? That you might put in order what was left unfinished. That is a general reason, you know, general meaning. Uh, and let us look at the specific. Because, you know, what do you mean by uh, to complete, put in order? It's a very common, like a general term. And this is the specific. And it said, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. That's number one. 
jumping to verse 10, look at this. For there are many rebellious, rebellious people in Greek, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. So what is the other task? They must be silent. Okay? So the general reason why Paul assigned Titus is so that he could straighten those people in, in the island of Crete. And that's the reason why we have that uh, title. And the specific uh, way or how we can do it is appoint elders and silence the false teachers. Do you follow me? Okay, good. So two major tasks, right? To put an order and uh, the specific task, appoint elders and review false teachers. You know, after Paul successfully uh, evangelized uh, in the island of Crete, there were still a lot of young Christians to take care of, right? Paul left Titus behind to build stable churches with mature, qualified pastor for the people. That is the reason why he left Titus in the island of Crete. Paul said to Titus, May you want you know, a point, a side to point and put some order in the church. You know, Titus had to find and train capable leaders for the church in the island of Crete. Now, in this verse, in this chapter, somehow showcase Paul's confidence with Titus. Did you get it? Did you catch what I said? This verse, in this chapter, showcase Paul's confidence with Titus. What do you mean, Pastor Dead? Let me explain. You know, the initial idea was to let Titus in Greek in a temporarily limited basis, and this is to solve those problems and establish godly people or godly leaders and move on. That was the major idea. You know, in situation like this, you know, if, if we're going to find out who are these Cretans, the people in Crete, they were called Cretans. You know, the, the way they were described, they are lazy, gluten, they are, what, what is that? Uh, uh, liars, evil brutes. Okay, if you know, if you try to understand or check the dictionary about the meaning of those words, you will feel disgusted, okay? But later we will go there. Uh, let, let me go back here. In situation like this, where you are inside an island called Crete, imagine you are Titus, and the people are like this, you know, they, they are so much chaos problem. Uh, Sometimes the difficult task is needed, right? And most of the time, we can see two types or two kinds of person. Okay, the first person, we hear people say, the job is tough, so we can send him. Meaning, you know, uh, the, the, the task is so hard, so we cannot send that guy. You know, we hear that word sometimes from other people. But there are, there, are, there are another type of person, and this is how we hear it. Uh, the job is tough, meaning hard. So the job is tough or hard, so we must send him. Right? You see the difference? And at Paul's point of view, Titus fall on the second category. category. You know, the, 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 the situation is tough, so we must send him. Okay? My question and challenge to each and every one of us, if people would think about us when there is tough time, will they say, oh, don't send Sister Love. <laughs> the, the situation is tough. Or send Sister Love because the situation is tough. Where do you fall on that two types of person? You know? We call this in our native tongue, maasahan. Oh, yan, maasahan yan. How can you translate that in English? Reliable. reliable. Yeah. Oh, that guy, he can be trusted. He can, he is reliable, right? And that is the way Paul thinks about Titus. No, rather than, hi, naku, what <laughs> mayan? Oh, forget it. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll send another person. But with Paul and to Titus, he said, yeah, he's the man. He's the right guy. So Paul assigned Titus two important tasks, set an order and appoint elders to review false teachers. So now that we know the reason why Paul sent Titus or, or uh, let Titus in Crete, let's move on and read. Uh, this one is the reason. Now let's look at 
the requirements. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not weak-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing this honest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the truth, trustworthy message that he has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Wow! You know, this qualification, this requirement, I hope, you know, we can pass this. So, let's try to divide this into five relative sections. We could see everything here, but uh, to uh, further understand it, let me give you five relative sections. Number one, let's look at the family background, the requirements. It says there, faithful to his wife, right? The idea of one woman, one, one woman, man, it does not mean that a leader must be married, okay? That's not necessary. I mean, it would be good, but not necessary. Nor, it is that it is not the idea that a leader could never be married if his wife had passed away or if he were biblically divorced. So meaning, if, 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 your, if, if the, uh, the wife passed away, then he could still serve. Because, uh, like what it says there, must be faithful to his wife. The meaning is that he, the idea is that the leader has his focus upon one woman and that is being his wife. Okay? Number two says there, as a family background requirement, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. The leader must have raised his children well. His ability to lead the family of God must be first demonstrated but his ability to lead his own children. You know, that's a, a, a very tough requirement. I can attest. Okay? I'm not going to, to deny. It's hard. And I always ask my kids you know, to help me out. Right? And it's, I mean, it's hard. The emphasis is on the idea that the children are believers also. Okay? There's no perfect family. You know, we discuss this, I discuss this with There is no perfect husband, there's no perfect wife, and at the same, there's no perfect kids. But the good thing is God has given us grace so that we could uh, have at least, you know, uh, come to that standard. So this, why are we studying this? Because these are the requirements of being a leader. Okay? and an elder specific for this one but this can be also used for us leaders number two personality okay a while ago it's the family background now let's look at the personality it says there it needs to be blameless this word literally means nothing to hold uh, to take hold upon okay there must be nothing in life of that leader that others can take hold or attack his life or the church uh, in other words, there should be no ghosts in the past. Okay? And there, uh, that is, oh, he's a drug addict in the past. Oh, he's a, he's a drunkard in the past. Okay? Once you become Christians, you renounce all these things. And, uh, of course, before you get into the leadership, you tell, right? Uh, God would give us, you know, it doesn't mean that we have that past. We are no longer... Uh, qualified to become leaders, we are still qualified. We just simply need to to uh, know, or everyone should accept, you know, that repentance. Personality, okay, it says they're not overbearing, not quick tempered. You know, the ancient Greek word used here is orgilos, which actually refers to a settled state of anger. Than the flash or uncontation, uh, uncon occasional bad temper. Meaning, uh, the idea here is that this this is not just uh, it's not just like you know. I know anger or bad temper is wrong, but the idea here is that the habitual. It's not just like oh you get angry today and then oh <laughs> you you are disqualified already, right? Remember the Lord Jesus Christ became angry too, but he did not sin. Okay, that's the idea here. 
Uh, it speaks of a man who has a constant simmering anger and who nourishes his anger against others. Meaning, he's babying his anger. You know, close to the idea of a bitter man, not a better man, a bitter man. So, not arrogant. That's the personality. What else? Number three, the requirement is practices. Let's look at the practices. This is uh, from what we have read. It says they're not given to drunkenness. Those uh, those people who are lasengot, they keep on drinking, right? Those who drink more than is proper. It doesn't say that you are not allowed to drink, right? It says they're not given to drunkenness, okay? Sometimes all of us here occasionally we will be offered to drink, to, to make a toast, especially in wedding, right? So it's okay to drink, but it's not okay to be drunk, okay? So know, know, know your limitation, okay? What else? It says there, not violent. You know, the Greek themselves widened the meaning of this word to include not only violence in action, but also violence in speech. You know, the word came to mean one who uh, browbeats his fellow man. Meaning, when you say violent, you know, they only had this notion that you are violent towards your action. But you could also become violent through your words. Sometimes our words can hurt more than our action, right? What else? Not pursuing uh, dishonest gain. Not dishonest with money. Okay, so if you are uh, a leader or if you want to serve the Lord, you have to consider this, right? That, we, that, that money should always come next. You know, uh, it is, this is not, this should not be the motivation, okay? Uh, that is the practice, okay? Number four, requirements. The testimony, okay? It says there, uh, in terms of testimony, enjoy having uh, guests or being hospitable, lover of what is good, meaning optimistic, uh, a person who will not always complain, oh, I'm in it. Oh, I'm glue. Oh, you know, it's not enough. Oh, it's always lacking. Oh, there's always problem, right? Being pessimistic, then you will not. It says they're lover of good, who loves what is good. So if you are the type of God, I mean, if you are the, the type of guy, then you have to change your mindset. Sober-minded or self-control. You know, in, in other in other translation, it says sober-minded. This describes a person who is able to think clearly and with clarity. Okay? This is important to, to, to leaders. Okay? This is important to leaders. Uh, a person is able to think clearly with clarity. They are not constant joke makers, but know how to deal with serious subjects in a serious way. So that is why when, when we appoint leaders or when we ask for leaders, we look at this testimony, right? Uh, we, just, we don't just simply uh, ask people to join without knowing their background. And look at this. Uh, it says they're upright, holy, and disciplined. In other translation, it says just holy and self-controlled. What does that mean? Let me give you that meaning. Upright meaning he, he have this right with men. Uh, holy, right with God. Meaning, ano yung right with God? Um, tama siya sa harap ng Panginoon. Tama siya sa harap ng tao. And tama siya sa harap ng kanyang sarili. Okay? Right with men, upright, right with God, he should be holy, and disciplined, right with himself. Okay? So, it's not possible that you are only right to yourself. And then you want to aspire a role as a leader, right? Or a, a church leader, okay? So, number five. Requirement is the conviction. Look at verse uh, verse nine. It says that he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that he has been taught, okay? This means that the leader must be sure of the faithful word for himself. Okay? When he brings the word of God to people, he must bring it with confidence and authority, not mixed with theological speculation and academic doubts. So meaning, 
a leader or someone who would aspire to become leaders, and I encourage you to aspire to become leaders too, right? Then we should know our doctrine. We should know our uh, our theology. You know, this means that leader has been under the teaching of someone else. Look at that. It says that it has been taught. Meaning, someone has taught him already, right? So meaning, that person needs to become a, a, a good student as well, right? A leader has been under the teaching of someone else. A qualified leader doesn't necessarily need to go to a Bible college or seminary, though it is good. But they do, uh, they do need to be taught and di uh, discipled by someone, not just themselves. Okay? Uh, not all leaders in the church are Bible study students or who graduate in, in, in school, right? But the, the point is uh, uh, someone who needs to have uh, the spirit of being taught. Ayun ang tawag nila doon sa English. Ang tawag nila doon? Teachable heart, sorry, thank you. Now, who's an appalling blessing? Oras na po ba? Sabi niya na lang. Let me, 10 minutes? Okay, good. 10 minutes na lang ako. That's good. Task 2. That is the first task, right? What is the first task given to Titus? To appoint elders. Right? What is the reason? So that he could straighten the thing that was left behind and uh, and how? By appointing elders. Titus used this to appoint elders, but us, we could use this to appoint our leaders in our modern day. And we just simply try to learn, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, we, we learn the, the reason and the requirements. And again, I, I urge you to read it on your own uh, house or home so that you could understand it more. I'm just simply giving you the base or the the, uh, the basics. Okay, number two, second task, silencing of the false teacher. Uh, before, he was working with uh, elders this time, or true believers this time, false teachers. Look at verse 10, it says here, uh, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole household by teaching these things ought not to teach, and that for the sake of this honest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said, look at this, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy glutons. That was their reputation. This saying is true, therefore, look at this, Rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the pain and will pay no attention to Jewish myth or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Verse 15, he gives this principle to the pure. All things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their action, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So at this point, Paul is referring to the people who doesn't follow God. And the second task that Paul gave to Titus was to silence those false teachers. Apparently, these false teachers are causing troubles in the island of Crete. And to understand this, let us look closely. The characteristic of these false teachers says there, <clears throat> they are rebellious people, they are full of meaningless talk, dishonest gainers, and they rejected the truth. Okay? So meaning, uh, what can we see here? These are all negative uh, traits of, of those uh, false teachers. They only do the ministry for their own purpose or their own uh, uh, satisfaction or self-gain, right? So this is how we would know them, right? So we would know if there is a false teacher or false leader within the church, not only in our church, but even outside, it, it, some, you know, especially if you watch online, you know, ministry and everything, if they are more into their own personal gain, 
then start questioning, right? If they are not, if they are just simply talking about so many things, but where is the Bible scripture? You have heard him talk like for an hour, but there's no Bible scripture. And at, at the end, they will offer, oh, you buy this and you give this. So start questioning. Those are false teachers, right? These are some of the guidelines, right? They reject the truth. What else? The complication or the contradiction of uh, this false teacher. What do, they, what, what do they cause? They cause disruption of the whole household by teaching things they ought not to teach. It creates conflict. It creates contradiction. Remember, the Bible will not contradict itself. Right? So they disrupt, they teach things they ought not to teach. They promote and practice this honest game. They promote Jewish myths and they cause contradiction and conflict. So this is what they cause, you know, with the, these false teachers. So we could, we, could, we could identify false teachers by their fruits, the result of their works. And what is, so we talk about the characteristics and the contradiction. So what is the charge? They must be silent. They must be silent. How? Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Don't patronize them. Right? Uh, that, that is a direct instruction from God. They must be silent. We have to have that courage and boldness. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Just tell them directly. This is not according to scripture. You don't have biblical basis. What is the verse that supports your claim? Right? Stuff like that. But look at this. Beyond the problem with false teachers, how <laughs> funny, there are a, the present of problem with false followers. So you thought the problem is only with false teacher? There's also a problem with false followers in the island of Crete. Look at this. The character of the Cretans, just like what I've said, they are always liars. You know, you are a liar. You are a liar, but always liars. <laughs> you know, imagine, you, that means that you never say anything true. Because always, right? Even brutes. I, I check what you mean by brutes. Brutes, uh, it, it means a beast. A, a, a creature or a sadist. You know, that's the meaning of evil sadist or sadista. Or uh, you are a beast. Lazy glutons. You know, when you say glutons, I check the dictionary and this is what it said. It's a pig. Babu. Or, or a hefty eater. So this is the characteristic of those Cretans. They, they are liars. They are, you know, they are sadists. And they only want to eat. Uh, who wants to be friends with these people? No one, right? And that is the problem that Titus is facing. If, if I am Titus, I would say to Paul, Paul, why did you let me hear? With all this, you know, lazy, lazy glutons and this evil brute. Right? The problem in the island of Crete was difficult, right? It's not only about the problem of false teacher, but also a problem of false follower. Look at the confusion that, they, uh, that this Cretans is doing. Uh, uh, what is the instruction? Paul is saying, uh, therefore rebuke them uh, sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. And they will, why? Because they always pay attention to Jewish myths, to the, uh, to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. So in another way, we are saying that these people, they are easily get swayed. They are easily get corrupted. They easily get uh, or pay attention to Jewish meat. You know, but then, uh, they can easily be uh, tricked. So these people, and that's the reason why the charge is rebuke them sharply. The, uh, for the false teacher, they need to be silent. But for the Cretans who are following the false teacher, you need to rebuke them. And when you say you rebuke them, it means that you have to uh, correct them, right? You have to correct them. Uh, this is in which indicates the character problem among uh, among the Cretans. They are evil beasts, liars, and lazy Cretans. The fact that Cretans had this lazy character show why it is important for Titus to appoint elders to lead the church. So, yun pala yun. That is the reason why Paul 
Taas Taitus. Because these people, they are, they are lazy, they only want to eat, they are evil in their thoughts, and they are poor teachers. So that is the reason why Taitus stay there. You are the get-go man. I want you to settle things straight out. Okay? And because of this, the congregation uh, were, were left to themselves. Chaos and error would dominate the church. You know, if, 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 if Titus would not be sent out, that would happen. So let me go now to my application and conclusion. So a quick summary, what can we learn at this point? Again, this is just only chapter 1. And we studied the letter of Paul to Titus. We studied uh, chapter 2 next time. Two things. Number one, the application know how to appoint leaders, but most importantly, know how to become one. Right? We have, we have been given the, the, the pattern, the requirements, and the reason, and let's apply it. Not only for other people, but to ourselves uh, as well. Number two, know how to silence false teachers and correct false followers. Okay? And as a conclusion, uh, God, with all His omniscient attribute, meaning all-knowing, and despite of His omnipotent all-power capability, look at this and listen. Still, He values the idea of having order and system inside the church. Right? The, you know, the Lord can just simply snap His finger and everything will become in order. But He never do that. Still, He values order and system inside the, chair, the, the church. Now, um, and this is the sad part because we find this lacking nowadays. You know, the pandemic that hit the world did really manage to bring some damage within the church. Whether you agree or not, it brings damage, right? Uh, you probably will know some, someone, a friend of yours, who, who uh, become uh, deteriorate, you know, in, in his Christian life. You know, but the difficulties of the church get tougher and it becomes compounded when the problem arises in the leaders and the members as well. You know, it basically further the damage. And I hope the letter we studied this afternoon, I know this is just a simple letter, though uh, it did not only inspire us but also teaches us that the main aim of uh, church government is not only to promote, but also to preserve. To promote and preserve church ethical standard and church order. Yes, we are called to ministry, but at the same time, we are called to execute our tasks responsibly and adequately. In short, it needs to be systematic. You know, not lacking of anything, but hopefully complete in everything from start to end, meaning sustainable. You know, just like the saying goes, we are not only called to start, but also called to complete. You know, some people, they will start the ministry, but they will let it hang in. Let's continue to strengthen our church by straightening it for God's glory. So let's come to the Lord our Heavenly Father God, Lord, once again, we would like to thank you and uh, honor you, Lord God, uh, for this message that we have heard from you. Lord, I, we pray uh, with this simple letter that Paul wrote to Titus, that this will give us some inspiration and pattern, Lord God, on how we could... Um, set order in our church as well, and how we can uh, address the needs of our church. Lord, thank you, because you never leave us in the dark. Uh, you give us all this instruction and inspiration so that we could apply it in our local ministry. Thank you, Lord God, for our church. Thank you, Lord God, for the ministry. And thank you, Lord God, for the people that you are using in, uh, in our leadership. Uh, we commit to you everything in Jesus' name. Amen.